Yeah, this is Group 7. I'd very much um, encourage Group 7 to un un uh, unmask yourselves and <laughs> wave and say hi, because it's very much a team effort. Um, but this project was the one around quantifying uncertainty in power system design. So a lot of the stuff that's been motivated actually by Groups 2 and 5 was kind of where we're trying to propose some sort of solutions to that, um, not necessarily solve it in the hackathon, but to, to work towards those solutions, as you'll see. So stepping back and thinking about the big picture, the issue about climate change is that it's driving a massive change in the energy, se in the energy sector. So there's a massive growth in renewables, such as wind and solar, with hundreds of trillions of, uh, sorry, hundreds of billions of investment every year going in. Um, and we're talking about electrifying many other sectors like heating and uh, transport. And basically what this is doing is it's completely changing the sensitivity of that system, the electricity system, to weather. Now, a central issue in that is that in an electricity system, supply and demand have to balance. You have to generate as much as you're using pretty much in real time. And um, obviously storage kind of complicates that picture, but broadly speaking, you have to be generating the energy you're using at any given time. So there are kind of, from a climate perspective, there are two questions. Um, one is about the existing infrastructure to cope with the fact that the climate is changing. And the second one is about designing your infrastructure of the future such that it's robust to whatever changes might occur into the future. So there's no good building a lot of wind if there was going to be no wind in the future, for example. So the real need to kind of explore these uncertainties have been kind of mentioned by the other groups um, to do with climate emissions pathways, to do with the natural variability of the climate from years to decades, and um, to do with climate model uncertainties. We've heard that different climate models give slightly different answers, and to do with the assumptions that we're baking into these passive models, particularly things around the cost of different technologies, their efficiencies, their technical characteristics. And just to go back a little bit, it's about those two kind of key issues. Um, the first one, this one about um, infra existing infrastructure and how it copes, um, the kind of the poster child of that is the consideration of in the UK of peak demand net wind. How much wind duration do we have when the demand is at, demand is at its highest? Um, there's been numerous studies on that over the years, and that data that Laura was um, talking about in Group 2 is a fantastic resource for exploring that. But what we're interested in in group five is more the second one of these two questions. It's about the design of the new infrastructure, more like group five's work. It's how do we design future systems that are somehow robust to the kind of uncertainty that's being presented? And for that, you get unavoidably into these kind of power system planning models. And um, so we're going to talk about those a bit. This Calliope and Pi PSA are examples of them. So the modeling challenge, as, a, as I'm a climate scientist by background, the, the modeling challenge is this. The kind of the, 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 the sort of the simple bit in inverse commons, it's not, not easy by any means, but the simple bit of it is essentially you're taking some climate data and you're converting it into some estimated potentials of renewable generation. So if I know what the wind is, I can run it through some kind of function, a power curve, to get a reasonably good estimate of how much power would actually be produced if there was a wind turbine there to draw upon it. Same for solar, same to some extent for demand. There are challenges with demand because that involves human factors, but... Essentially, you can write more as a function that takes you from weather to those primary input variables. The bit where it gets more complicated is that, well, we're interested in kind of more complicated things. We've got a power system that not only has all these renewable bits and demand that are sensitive to weather, it has a lot of other stuff. Conventional sources, biomass burning, transmission lines, all these kind of things that also need to be designed. And the way that's handled is through a power system planning model, which essentially takes those inputs plus a bunch of other economic and technical and social um, assumptions and optimizes it in some form to estimate the design of that power system of the future. So it estimates how much wind we should build, how much solar power we should build, how much biomass we should build, how much coal and gas and whatever else technology we might want to build. The problem is then that then there's no one-to-one -one mapping, no function you can write out that gets you from the climate data all the way through to those installed capacities. You have to run the optimization model in the middle. The issue with that is that, well, historically, certainly it's gradually changing, I'm pleased to, pleased to see, but the availability of hourly data, once you get beyond historical data sets, reanalysis data sets, there isn't much. The data when it is there is absolutely huge. The problem for that then is if you're then trying to run an optimization model, if you run a good sort of disaggregated optimization model of the power system, is it gets massively computationally expensive. So typically these models are run with just a handful of years at a time. So that then raises the question when you get to the end is, are the solutions I'm producing robust? Are they robust to the climate sample I'm using, to the climate change in my experience, to the modeling assumptions I've made at each step of that chain? Is it robust? Are the solutions I'm finding robust to it? 
And just to hopefully convince you that I'm not, I've, hopefully people are in this room are fairly convinced that to make you convinced that it's that it's not just inventing a problem. Um, this is uh, a student of mine who ran um, some simulations of the power system planning model. He ran different years of historic weather data through this power system modeling power system model, and it decided which of four different technologies to build. Don't necessarily worry about the details, but essentially four different technological characteristics. So some are cheap to build, expensive to run, some are expensive to build, cheap to run, and it chooses between them. What you can see is depending on which weather year you pick, you can end up with a massive range of outcomes. From one year we picked had virtually no wind power installed, one year we, we built had 35 gigawatts of wind power installed. So that's just picking a different weather year. So that the, the weather you pick has a big impact. When we think about the future, this is um, work from a group in the US. They did a very good quality model, good quality climate data, good quality power system model of Texas, designing the Texas power system of the future. And one of the headline results of their paper was that they threw data from five different climate models into this optimization. And all of them showed a consistent reduction in nuclear. They all use nuclear power less. But when you look down at the details, the, of the five models, five different climate models, four of them went out it one way. They built a load of renewables, basically over here, mostly wind, maybe a bit of solar. But one of them decided to build a lot more coal, decided to use coal a lot more. And there was no real, there's no real kind of understanding of why. What, you know, what is it about the characteristics of that model that gave it that result? And how confident can we be in the output? So the different climate models make a difference. And the power system model parameters make a difference. This is some experiments that um, uh, Yifu and Changlong did in the group um, using the Calliope model. Essentially here, we're just, we have a two zone model, GB and Ireland, and we've tweaked the cost of installing solar panels. And what you can see is that the, the results that it builds are very strongly impacted. The different color bar show whether high, medium or low cost of building solar PV panels. But you can see for different technologies, obviously you build more solar when it's cheap, but on the other hand, you build less wind. You also build a bigger interconnector. You build more battery. And Ireland builds more wind, given the fact that UK's built, sorry, GB's built a lot less solar. So it kind of, there's these very complicated impacts that you wouldn't necessarily predict. So what we'd like to do really, if we're gonna attack it in the usual kind of ways, you'd want to do lots and lots of simulations. You want a Monte Carlo thing. You want to sort of span your parameter space. But the problem is because these computation, these passive models are very complex, it becomes computationally intractable. Even if the hourly data that you need to run these things, you need hourly data, even if it was there to run it. So the ambition of kind of this, this, this project was to produce a distributed computing experiment. What we want is a community design experiment. So working with power system modelers and experts across the two fields to design the right kind of experiment. We then set up on the climate.net framework. Now this is one of these distributed computing experiments, computing at home, if you like. So different users download a client model and they run a simulation and return the results back to HQ for analysis. So you can run thousands of realizations of climate. We want to run the client model, bias corrected appropriately, convert it to energy variables, convert from wind to wind power, for example, run it through an energy model, return that data set, and then explore that data as a community. And by doing this, we can then investigate a whole range of different scenarios, thousands of scenarios, investigating climate forcing, um, climate model uncertainty, initial condition uncertainty, so natural variability, choices made in the modeling process, the energy scenario, the energy model parameters, we can start to explore that. And the idea would be to kind of build towards something where we could do a release of this. What we want to do in the hackathon was prototype it effectively. So what we want to do is be able to get this running on Jasmine. So instead of having it running on home computers, we're running on Jasmine. We have one year's worth of climate model data. It's hourly resolution. It runs for a year, 25 kilometer grid boxes. We want to devise a minimal bias correction, just assess that it's reasonable, convert it to PV and wind and demand, run it through a simple power system model, and get a test data set where we can do some sensitivity testing. So our goal was to develop this prototype, work out how that prototype could be moved into a release version to run on people's PCs at home, and then begin this kind of process of the community design of the experiment. Those are kind of our ambitions, if you like. So to give you the feeling we've done some real hard work, so this is work by Matt and Sarah in the group, and they took on the, so the climate parts of this, that we took six variables um, hourly over a year, and essentially, based on versions of um, Hannah Bloomfield's the, the University of Reading models, um, we developed models for wind, wind capacity factor, solar PV, and electricity demand. And this shows some sample output. This is the PDFs of distributions for observed data from ERA5 and climate.net data. So you can see that we're sort of comparable for uh, Irish demand and Irish wind, for example. 
And you can see that the output that it's producing is again plausible. So this is from reanalysis, observations, and on the right is from our weather data. It's not, we wouldn't expect a one-to-one -one match, but you can see it's kind of doing the right kind of jiggles up and down. So we kind of were able to produce good climate in, energy input data to run in an energy model from the climate prediction model net um, experiments. All right, you've had 10 minutes now. Thanks. So building on that, we do this two zone Kayot model, which is built on um, Bryn's model from that was picked up in group two. And since we now run this Jasmine, this is Yifu and Changlong, and um, with a lot of help from the Kaliop team. Um, and essentially, we ran this sensitivity test, as I said, about changing the cost of PV and got some interesting results. And just about three minutes after we started this part of the meeting, this, this presentation thing, we managed to run it finally with the actual climate shot net data and the era five data as well. So we, we finally got the, the, the pipe working. Um, I don't want to say too much more than that at this stage, but we got the pipe working. We also had um, Andy Bowery um, leading work around kind of the technical operational, operational things of actually converting it from running on Jasmine to running on home PCs. There are different issues about data transfer and issues about installing different bits of software. So um, Andy's been developing a big, a big picture view of how we go about that step. Um, and we had a joint meeting across the working groups, across the different groups in the hackathon on Thursday. Um, I was very pleased to was a fair degree of support for this as an idea and um, developing kind of how we might design the real experiment for release, building around this Euro Calliope um, model, which is a 34 zone model across Europe. And we identified a number of important features, talked about the time periods we would target, talked about the data needs of input output. We talked about how to span an initial parameter uncertainty space in the energy model. And we even identified a possible funding call for where we might go to get some money for it and a number of innovations about exactly how we design that framework um, and exactly where it could be used. So there's a number of kind of a problems and angles um, arising from there. So in summary, uh, we've developed this end-to-end -end prototype sort of a demo of principle, if you like. It's not scientific results that are useful in themselves, but the process of it and the mechanics and the, the plumbing of the software is there. Um, a lot of that's been transferred to GitHub. We've written a lot of how-tos and sort of simplified instructions on how to set up in Jasmine. We've personally learned an awful lot um, and we performed a, some initial sensitivity test experiments. We've been making notes on what's required for operationalizing it, running it at home. And we've had some productive discussions around this kind of how we format the release experiment, the, the real experiment, and taking it forward to proposals. And if people are interested, um, we host a next generation challenge in energy climate modeling workshop. Next edition will be in 16th, 17th, 17th and 17th September this year. And we'll probably run a breakout group on taking this a bit forward there. Um, so yeah, that's thanks to the whole team. But um, if you want any more information and you want to get involved in things going forward, please do drop me an email. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Great to hear the uh, have the uh, kind of a breakneck finish there with um uh, <laughs> with a uh, I I feel like I've been busy just chairing this session, but you've actually been a. Uh, been doing work during the session as well so congratulations to, well, not to not me that, that was chang long he was he was hard at work <laughs> no, it's, and it's, it's middle of the night for him he's, he's been working from australia so uh, he's, he's, he deserves double credit for that one. Oh yes definitely definitely um great uh question from Stephen. hi sorry it's going to be another two-parter i keep uh, <laughs> but um i guess the first one is uh i was it adrian hilber's work you mentioned there before obviously i think he you, you talk about the Monte Carlo's are expensive, obviously, and I believe if I read Adrian's things in the past, he, he sort of did um, importance sampling. So you reduce that, that Monte Carlo down. So I guess the first question is, um, you know, what's, how do you compare this to sort of that sort of technique of reducing down the, the, the problem, actually, rather than just sort of trying to, you know, just increase your computational resources? Um, and I guess the second one is um, related to cut that in a way is, do you try and model the uh, interdependencies between those different variables you use? And in that, that in some ways maybe reduces down your, your computation. So, and, and, or is that, is that important, would you say, to have the sort of joint distribution of all these variables rather than sort of the individual components? So uh, on the first one, Aiden's technique is about subsampling a known data set. So it's a good way of reducing the size of that data to retain a good estimate of the uncertainties in that data. What it can't do is tell you how representative that data is of a wider truth, if you like. So Adrian's method lets you get down from 40 years worth of reanalysis data down to one or two. But it won't tell you whether that one or two years 
is a good representation of that fourth year sample that you started from is a good representation of all possible climates or all possible future climates. So it's tackling a different problem. We might end up using part of Adrian's stuff to reduce the size of the simulations you want to perform within this, but the, the fact that we're running climate models lets you um, explore a much greater range of climates that are plausible than is just possible with the historical data sets that Adrian's stuff applies to. So it's sort of complementary, in the light, if you like. It's not it's not tackling the same problem. In terms of the relationship between the variables, I mean, this is kind of what we saw in um, the in group five's presentation is that there are so many and so varied. It's hard to model those weather data without actually using a weather model or a climate model. That's kind of the the starting point. So all those relationships are implicit, imperfectly represented, but imperfectly represented, but they're implicit in the climate model in the way it develops its own weather phenomena. So that, that's where those carry through. And it's hard to see. In order to, people have played for ages with statistical generators of weather and things. Um, and frankly, the, the, the problem is you're always then concentrated to the data you trained it on, which, you know, but we've got a future where we don't know what it's going to be. So you end up sort of hitting problems. And maintaining that co variable between, I don't know, five different variables across at least 20 or 30 different locations hourly resolution whilst maintaining all dynal cycles and everything else it just gets impossible so i can't personally i can't see a way to do it without getting climate data from climate models interesting thanks yeah. great thanks and i guess on on that kind of training aspect so what's what's the kind of regional footprint here i guess this is so you need to have um you need to kind of be training your energy model i guess on the um on particular regions i mean is this, is this the kind of thing that that is essentially only feasible over Europe or something at the moment. I mean, what's the kind of regional ambition here? Um, I, I feel like I'm trying to answer that. Let's let some of groups and take some of the other. I, I, I think um, energy models don't they don't validate them in the same way that we do with climate models. So there's a difference in philosophy and difference in approach. There isn't really a, a process of validating an energy model in the same way as there is climate. That initially sounds very dissatisfying as a climate scientist, but it, it's 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 a known thing um, and I think you have to work with where you are. In terms of scope, it only makes sense connecting up energy systems where they're connected. So we had a, a useful discussion around the inclusion of other sectors. So if you would include fuel that's transported in from America or I don't know, where, they, where they pipe fuel in from or whatever it is, and then possibly then you broaden it out. But the electricity sector kind of makes sense as far as I understand it on a European level. And um, I don't know if the Yifu or Changlong are still here, I want to comment on that, but kind of Europe kind of makes sense as a unit for energy. There are smaller zones that would make sense, um, but yeah, for electricity, you wouldn't sort of connect the US because they're they're not connected. If you know what I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we, we did talk about trying to do this for other regions of the world as well. It was another uh, issue that came up in the um, sort of the community chat a bit. Mm. So it, it does lend itself to the approach of having a you know a kind of a, a high resolution regional climate model embedded in a global model that is then the, yeah. Yeah. You know, that gives you a region to focus on with with quite high resolution data yeah. and one thing that was identified as well is that this could be and it was actually david who pointed this out um is that if we can get it working for one model for one region there's no real reason why you can't get it working for another model for another region mm -hmm. you know once you get the pipeline there and the infrastructure there then mm -hmm. people should be able to ask more questions using the same you know tweaks on the same infrastructure but until we get the infrastructure there for the first time, we can't we can't do this. But yeah. um, but okay, the, next uh, year's next year's hackathon will be easier then. Oh, may, maybe yeah, yeah yeah. But um yeah, but I mean going back to the stuff that you know you're saying about the the three models, the three Eurocodox models from in Group Five. That this is hopefully a way to get you know a thousand distinct distinct simulations. Um, as you're aware, it's a perturbed physics rather than a, a perturbed model, a different model. But um yeah, it's yeah, it's a way to start hacking away at some of these issues. Yeah, great. Brilliant. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on, shall we, to our, our grand finale of Group 9. <laughs>